Bonjour mes amis, my name is Freya, and welcome to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy DOS game. Okay, so this one I know is old. It was made in 1984 by Infocom. And, okay, so let me just preface this by saying I love the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I looked up in my school library on a whim in, like, sixth grade. I know that's really lame because it came out long before I was born. I should have been, like, breastfed with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy playing in the background. But, uh, my mom tried to get me into it when I was younger, and I just wouldn't hear of it for some reason because I was an ignorant child, and I knew nothing about fine entertainment. So I looked it up in middle school, and it became my life for three years or so. I didn't go anywhere without a towel. I dug up one of my old sketchbooks and it was full of doodles of Marvin. <laughs> I was so, so obsessed with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I played the game and I was notoriously pretty awful at it, but that wasn't my fault because the game is designed to be uniquely frustrating. So it's probably a good thing that I already know how to play it because you guys don't want to watch me suffer and fail over and over again, do you? I, I hope you don't. <laughs> so, um, everybody, get your towels. Let's dive right in. You wake up. The room is spinning very gently round your head. Or at least it would be if you could see it, which you can't. It is pitch black. So, turn on the light to solve the pitch black. Let's start to the day. Pity it's going to be the worst one of your life. The light is now on. Bedroom in the bed. The bedroom is a mess. It is a small bedroom with a faded carpet and old wallpaper. There's a wash basin, a chair with a tatty dressing gown slung over it, and a window with the curtains drawn. Near the exit leading south is a phone. There's a flathead screwdriver and a toothbrush. Okay. So, the thing about this game is you can't forget anything. Like, I forgot to pick up the toothbrush at the beginning of the game once, and then I played through the entire thing and needed it at the very end. That was the last thing I needed, and I just rage quit. So let's get up. Very difficult, but you manage it. The room is still spinning. It dips and sways a little. Okay, take gown, because I've got a hangover. Luckily, this is large enough for you to get hold of. You notice something in the pocket. Dawn gown. You're now wearing your gown. Open pocket. You gotta do everything step by step. Opening your gown reve reveals a buffered analgesic, pocket fluff, and a thing your aunt gave you, but you don't know what it is. You swallow the tablet. After a few seconds, the room begins to calm down and behave in an orderly manner. Your terrible headache goes. Alright, so that means I can pick up other stuff, because I'm no longer hungover for some reason. So, take all. Yeah, why not? Screwdriver, taken. As you pick up the toothbrush, a tree outside the window collapses. There is no causal relationship between these two events. You pick up the receiver. A moment later, the dialing tone is suddenly cut off. Glancing through the window, you can't help but notice the large old oak tree, of which you are particularly fond, crashing down through the phone cable. Shouldn't you be taking more interest in the events of the world around you, while you've got it? Alright. That's tragic. Leaving. You make your way down to the front porch. This is the enclosed front porch of your home. Your front garden lies to the south, and you can re-enter your home to the north. On the doormat is a pile of junk mail. Gather up the pile of mail. front of the house, you can re-enter your home to the north. A path leads around it to the northeast and northwest, and a country lane is visible to the south. All that lies between your home and the huge yellow bulldozer bearing down on it is a few yards of mud. Mr. Prosser, from the local council, is standing on the other side of the bulldozer. He seems to be wearing a digital watch. He looks startled to see you emerge, and yells at you to get out of the way. The bulldozer rumbles slowly toward your home. Lie down in front of the bulldozer down in the path of the advancing bulldozer. Prosser yells at you to for Christ's sake move. Ha <laughs> ha. Wait. Time passes. The bulldozer thunders toward you. The ground is shaking beneath you as you lie in the mud. Time passes. The noise of the giant bulldozer is now so violently loud that you can't even hear Prosser yelling to warn you that you will be killed if you don't get the hell out of the way. You just see him gesticulating wildly. With a terrible grinding of gears, the bulldozer comes to an abrupt halt just in front of you. 
It shakes, shudders, and emits noxious substances all over your rosebed. Prosser is incoherent with rage. Moments later, your friend Ford Prefect arrives. He hardly seems to notice your predicament, but keeps glancing nervously at the sky. He says, hello, Arthur, takes a towel from his battered leather satchel, and offers it to you. Ford, what about my home? Ford looks startled, then guilty. He starts to say something and stops. He starts to say something else and stops. Suddenly, he seems to see the bulldozer for the first time, stops starting to say things, and starts. He seems to come to a momentous decision, says he has something of earth-shattering importance to tell you, and stresses the importance of a quick drink at the horse and groom. Pointing toward Prosser, you exclaim, But that man wants to knock my house down! Ford goes off for a quiet word with Prosser. From where you're lying, you cannot hear what's happening, although they seem deeply engrossed in conversation. Time passes. Ford and Prosser stop talking and approach you. Ford says that Prosser has agreed to lie in your place so that the two of you can go off to the pub. Reluctantly, Prosser steps forward and lies down in front of the bulldozer. You stand up. <laughs> okay, so they don't make it clear in the uh, video game exactly what conversation they had. Even when you play as Ford later on, they don't make it as obvious how beautiful that scene was. It's just this harebrained kind of logic that doesn't sound reasonable by any stretch of the imagination, and even Prosser realizes that, but he's too confused to actually know what to do about it, and that's great. Also, in the um, books, Prosser is talking to Arthur at one point, and he's talking about how, oh, you should have made a protest at the appropriate time, <laughs> and... Um, I believe the conversation went something along the lines of, I eventually had to go down to the cellar to find them. Well, that's the display department. With a torch. Well, the lights had probably gone. So at the stairs. But you did see the notice, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. It was on display in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet stuck in a disused lavatory with a sign on the door saying, Beware of the Leopard. Can you tell I'm really into this series? Like, wow. <laughs> but no, I just thought that was the funniest thing ever. Beware of the Leopard. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Ford, urging you to follow, hurries toward the country lane. Follow Ford. In a state of anxiety and confusion, you follow Ford down the lane. The road runs from your home to the north toward the village pub to the west. Ford Prefect is here. Come along, Arthur, says Ford impatiently and enters the pub. Go Ford. The pub is pleasant and cheerful, and full of pleasant and cheerful people who don't know they've got about twelve minutes to live, and are therefore having a spot of lunch. Some music is playing on an old jukebox. The exit is east. Ford Prefect is here. There is a barman serving at the bar. Behind the bar is a shelf. It is full of the sort of items you find on shelves behind bars and pubs. Ford buys lots of beer and offers half to you. Muscle relaxant, he says impenetrably. So I think you need to drink three times. But before I do that, I'm going to ask the barman for a sandwich. The barman gives you a cheese sandwich. The bread is like the stuff that stereos come packed in. The cheese would be great for rubbing out spelling mistakes, and margarine and pickle have performed an unedifying chemical reaction to produce something that shouldn't be, but is, turquoise. Since it is clearly unfit for human consumption, you are grateful to be charged only a pound for it. Drink the beer, urges Ford. It will help cushion your system against the coming shock of the matter transference beam. Drink. It's very good beer, brewed by a small local company. You particularly like its flavor, which is why you woke up feeling so wretched this morning. You were at somebody's birthday party here in the pub last night. You begin to relax and enjoy yourself, so when Ford mentions that he's from a small planet in the vicinity of Beetlejuice, not from Guildford as he usually claims, you take it in stride and say, Oh yes, which part? It is really very pleasant stuff with a good, dry, nutty flavor. Some light froth on top and a deep color. It is at exactly room temperature. You reflect that the world cannot be all bad when there are such pleasures in it. Ford mentions that the world is going to end in about twelve minutes. There is a distant crash, which Ford explains is nothing to worry about, probably just your house being knocked down. So at this point, you gotta leave. Otherwise, you'll get, like, blind drunk and just not follow Ford when he leaves the Earth. Okay. You see the huge bulldozer heaving itself among the cloud of brick which is all that remains of your home. As you start up the lane, a small dog runs up to you, yapping. Ford hurries after you. Give sandwich to dog. 
The dog is deeply moved. With powerful sweeps of its tail, it indicates that it regards this cheese sandwich as one of the great cheese sandwiches. Nine out of ten pet owners could happen by at this point expressing any preference they pleased, but this dog would spurn both them and all their tins. This is a dog which has met its main sandwich. It eats with passion and ignores a passing microscopic space fleet. Okay, I don't remember which direction home is in. I'm gonna guess south? No, north. There we go. You reach the site of what was your home. It is now a pile of rubble. Mr. Prosser looks sheepishly triumphant, a trick few people can do, as it requires a lot of technically complex deltoid muscle work. Mr. Prosser, from the local council, is standing on the other side of the bulldozer. He seems to be wearing a digital watch. Ford hurries after you. There's nothing really to do at this point, but wait. So I'm gonna just attack Prosser. You muck up all his fancy facial work. This is the last moment of satisfaction you will experience for some time. Wait. With a noise like a cross between Led Zeppelin's farewell concert and the eruption of Krakatoa, a huge fleet of Vogon constructor ships flies overhead and announces that the Earth will be demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass in two of your Earth minutes. In all the turmoil, you drop the thing your aunt gave you, which you don't know what it is, and it rolls away. It is the least of your worries. Anyway, you've been trying to get rid of it for years. The vast yellow ships thunder across the sky, spreading waves of terror and panic in their wake. Don't panic. <laughs> the voice of the Vogon captain slams across the country, insisting that the planning charts and demolition orders have been available at the local planning office in Alpha Centauri for 50 years, and it's too late to start making a fuss about it now. Throughout the noise, Ford is shouting at you. He removes a small black device from his satchel, but accidentally drops it at your feet. Take device. Fierce gales whip across the land, and thunder bangs continuously through the air in the wake of the giant ships. Ford fights to reach you, but the wind is too fierce. Further announcements from the Vogon captain make it clear that demolition will begin in just a few seconds. Through the blinding rain, you see lights flickering on the small device. I never remember what button to press, so I'm just gonna examine device. The electronic sub signaling device is shaped like a small fist with an extended thumb. Various lights along its knuckles are currently blinking wildly, indicating a spaceship in the vicinity. It has two small buttons, a red one labeled Call Engineer, and a green one labeled Hitchhike. It bears a small label which reads, Another fine product of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. Affixed to the thumb is a lifetime guarantee. Green button. Lights whirl sickeningly around your head. The ground arches away beneath your feet and every atom of your being is scrambled, an experience you're probably going to have to get used to. You are in dark. All right, I think, um, I think I'm running out of time. So thank you everybody so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys later. Bye.